I'm Dr. Mark Attala, and I want to welcome you to the fifth chapter of Schultz and Schultz's History of Modern Psychology. Today we'll be talking about structuralism. This is unique in that this chapter is mostly about one person in their research, which is Edward Bradford Titchener. Now, why a chapter on one person? Well, there's a saying that history repeats itself and historians repeat each other. And I think that's why there's an entire chapter on one person whose school literally dies with him, and that's Titchener. Now, the first history of psychology was written by a husband and wife who were students of Titchener, and their name was The Borings. And you can't make this stuff up. But let's start by talking about some of the research that was done. So would you swallow a rubber tube that goes all the way to your stomach and then have hot water poured down that tube and then cold water? How about carrying a notebook to the bathroom to introspect on urinating and defecating? And if you're married, what about making notes on your elementary sensations and feelings while having sexual intercourse? Well, if you were a student of E.B. Titchener, the founder of the School of Structuralism, this is the kind of work that you would do. So welcome to structuralism. Now, Titchener was a brilliant student with a flair for languages. He was English, he was born in England, so he knew English, Latin, Greek, German, French, and Italian. And a professor of his at Oxford once gave him an article in Dutch and said he wanted a report on it in one week. So Titchener learned Dutch in a week. He became interested in psychology while he was at Oxford, so he went to Leipzig and studied with Wundt for two years, receiving his PhD in 1892. Now, he developed a close personal relationship with Wundt and Wundt's family. He was often invited to their home and even spent a Christmas with the Wundt family. He was unable to secure a position in England, so he moved to the United States and arrived at Cornell University at age 25, and he's still there. He died of a brain tumor at 60, and his brain has been preserved and displayed in a glass jar ever since. In 35 years at Cornell, Titchener supervised 56 different doctoral students, and he used their dissertations to build the system of structuralism. And he referred to his system as the only scientific psychology worthy of the name. Although he professed to be a follower of Wundt, he actually said that he was Wundt's ambassador to the United States, he dramatically altered Wundt's system. Titchener focuses on mental elements and discards Wundt's idea of apperception. Titchener's goal was to discover the nature of elementary conscious experience and analyze conscious experience into its component parts and thus determine its structure. Now, in 1904, a group of psychologists from Cornell, Yale, Michigan, Clark, and Princeton began meeting to compare notes, and they called themselves the Titchener Experimentalists. Titchener was a member, and he selected the topics and guests and dominated the meetings. Now, like Wundt, Titchener was a popular lecturer. He wore his full Oxford academic regalia to class and made every lecture a dramatic production. Both were also autocratic, domineering, and intolerant of dissent. Now, Titchener was a charter member of the American Psychological Association in 1892, but he resigned shortly thereafter because the association wouldn't expel a member that Titchener had accused of plagiarism. A, a friend of Titchener's, though, paid his dues for years so that he would continue to be listed as a member of the APA. And this reminds me of a Groucho Marx uh, line. Groucho Marx once said that he wouldn't want to be a part of any organization that would have someone like himself as a member. Titchener's the opposite. He wouldn't be a part of any organization that he wasn't in charge of and fawned over by the other members. Now, as a final note, in 1929, the, experimental, the Titchener Experimentalists were renamed the Society of Experimental Psychologists, and they're still active today. Titchener and women. Now, Titchener banned women from meetings of the experimentalists because he said that a man, a man, could not hope to become a psychologist until after he had learned to smoke cigars, and women were thought too pure to smoke cigars. Now, Christine Ladd Franklin had requested to present at the 1912 meeting of the experimentalists. 
She'd worked with Helmholtz in Germany and earned a PhD in mathematics. Now, that is to say she'd fulfilled the requirements for a PhD in mathematics from Johns Hopkins, but she was denied the degree because she was a woman. She was eventually granted the degree in 1927 when she was 78 years old, 44 years after she had earned it. Now, she was denied admission by Titchener, but continued her protests for years, calling his policy of excluding women immoral and unscientific, which uh, is absolutely true. Now, on the other hand, Margaret Floyd Washburn was the first woman to earn a doctoral degree in psychology in 1894, and she was one of Titchener's students. She said, quote, he didn't quite know what to do with me. Uh, Titch Titchener sent her dissertation to Wundt, who published it in Philosophical Studies in 1895. Now, Washburn eventually wrote an important book on comparative psychology called The, uh, the Animal Mind in 1908 and spent most of her career at Vassar. And she also served as president of the American Psychological Association in 1921. So Titchener encouraged and supported women in psychology, just not in the experimentalists. And more than a third of the 56 doctorates that, were, uh, that he supervised were awarded to women, which is more than any other male psychologist of that era. So I said earlier that Titchener differed from Wundt in that Titchener was interested in the analysis of complex conscious experience into its component parts, not the synthesis of the elements through apperception. So this is mostly like Kulp in his label of systematic experimental introspection. So Titchener wanted detailed qualitative subjective reports of mental activities. And he warned against committing what he calls the stimulus error. Now, this is calling something what it is rather than describing it in terms of its elements of color, brightness, and shape. So, for example, if you were introspecting on an apple, the stimulus error would be to say, that's an apple. Uh, it's the difference between the immediate experience and immediate experience. Titchener also refers to subjects as reagents, which is a term he borrows from chemistry. Reagents are essentially passive and are used to detect, examine, or measure other substances. So Titchener wants his subjects to be nothing more than impartial, detached machines. He diligently follows the rules of scientific experimentation and says an experiment is an observation that can be repeated, isolated, and varied. So Titchener poses three problems for psychology to reduce conscious processes to their simplest components, determine laws by which the elements are associated, and connect the elements with their physiological conditions. Now, the bulk of his research addresses only the first problem. And he thought there were three elements of consciousness, which he studied, which were sensations, images, and affective states. Sensations were things like sounds, sights, smells, evoked by physical objects. And for Titchener, sensations are the basic elements of perception. Images are the elements of ideas. They reflect experiences not present, and that means they are uh, not present in the moment. So it could be a memory of a past experience. And affective states are the elements of emotion and are found in experiences such as love, hate, and sadness. He publishes an outline of psychology in 1896, and this lists uh, the elements of sensations. And he identified 44,500 different elements of sensations. Of those, 32,820 were visual sensations and 11,600 were auditory sensations, all different and distinct sensations. Now, he says that mental elements have attributes that allow them to be distinguished. And these are five attributes, quality, intensity, duration, clearness and extensity. So quality is the things such as cold or red. Intensity is the sensations, strength, weakness, loudness, etc. Duration is the course of the sensation over time. Clearness, the role of attention in conscious experience. And extensity just refers to vision and touch. It's the idea of their taking up space. Criticisms of structuralism. Well, by 1920, even Titchener began to question the term structural psychology and took to calling it existential psychology. 
He was also reconsidering his introspective method in favor of a phenomenological approach uh, without trying to break consciousness down into its elements. So he was even changing his views of structural psychology. So what are the criticisms? A first one is that structuralism was a futile attempt to cling to antiquated principles and methods. Titchener himself, even in structuralism's heyday, had difficulty defining exactly what he meant by the introspective method. And in the end, he said it was, uh, it was meant to be just a generic term. A second criticism was, what, was the structuralist what were the structuralist introspectors trained to do? So for example, how do you describe a table without using the word table, which would be committing the stimulus error? An introspective language would have to be developed, and it never was. And even when experimental conditions were rigidly controlled, introspectors at different labs got different results. And it was often Titchener who had to resolve uh, who was right, which uh, uh, Watson eventually said was uh, religion rather than science. A third criticism was that introspection is really retrospection. And this is because there's a time lapse between the experience of the introspection and the report of the experience. And so you're not really introspecting, you're thinking about your thinking. It's a retrospective report. The fourth criticism is that if part of mental functioning is unconscious, then it can't be reported. And this criticism is based on Freud's notion of the unconscious mind. If the unconscious mind is at all determinative of behavior, then why study consciousness? The fifth criticism is that Titchener's conception of psychology was just too narrow. He regarded comparative psychology and child psychology as not being psychology at all. Well, what were the contributions of structuralism? And uh, that's intentionally left blank. Now, the era of structuralism was possible really just due to Titchener's force of personality, and it collapsed when he died. But to be serious, the significant contribution of structuralism really was its service as a strong established orthodoxy to rebel against. And I want to finish this, this chapter. Uh, it's a, there's a story that was attributed to Titchener, uh, which I think concludes things nicely. Titchener was once asked why animals don't speak. And he replied, because they have nothing to say. Now, there's an internal logic there. But in the end, it tells you nothing. And that's structuralism, at least to me. Uh, there's an internal logic that tells you nothing about psychology. That's chapter five, and thanks for listening.